Okay. What someone or something cares about is a constraint on his or her or its behavior. And that's important because if we're talking about natural intelligence, we might not be able to know for sure what it can do because it can always surprise us. But we might be able to know at least one thing or one kind of thing that it can't do. You can always imagine it doing something new, but there are, there are, you can put a boundary, we think. This is Retrace, segment number 13 uh, for November 10th, 2020. And um, we're talking about care, and I'm forgetting all of my steps here. Yeah, so, and the reason this matters is that you have to take caring seriously. If that's true, if caring really is a constraint on, intelli- on natural intel- any kind of intelligence, but we're talking about natural intelligence today, because we can't really imagine machines or otherwise non-natural intelligence is caring about something or anything. Um, if, if, we're, if you're interested in natural intelligence and, and you agree that it has a, a bright future, um, as the Churchlands said uh, that we previously quoted, uh, it, it's hard to know what, where the boundaries are. What can it do? And what can't it do? And while at least one, there two philosophers actually, have suggestions about what intelligence can or can't do on the basis of caring. And they're writing about the same time, 1979, John Hoglan, and, and, uh, and 1982, Harry Frankfurt. All right, listen. First question. If two beings, let's call them beings, they can be of any sort, but natural or artificial or otherwise, um, if they don't care about the same thing, or they don't, if one of them doesn't, let's say if one of them doesn't care about anything, whatever we mean by the word care, we'll get to that in a second, uh, can those two beings or entities, can they understand each other? And you might think, well, they don't really understand each other. It's an AI and a person. No, I mean like at all. Can they at all communicate? Okay. Depends on what you mean by communicate. But if we're talking about natural language, if we're talking about the stuff that we type or write or speak to each other, um, there's a pretty strong argument to be made, and it's been made by John Hogland, that um, they can't. They can't. You can't understand even the, even a scintilla of what's in a text, you know, a story, let's say, or in the words that I'm saying now, unless you care about something. Maybe it's not a strict rule. Maybe there are certain things that you can un- understand in text that, that you don't need caring for, and, and maybe the, the more important things you do need caring for. We don't know. But Hogland puts it this way. Um, he tells a fable, and it's this, it's like a snake versus a father, and then like, you know, the, the father loses his son, and the snake loses its tail, and then the snake says, you know, the father says, one of them says to the other one, um, you know, we're even now, let's be friends again. And then the other one says, no, we can't be friends again. I'll never get over this. And I'm doing a bad retelling of it, but the point is that um, there's a big difference. We know reading this text, this little blurb of, you know, it's not even, a, you know, it's a blurb, but it's a little, we know there's a huge difference between losing a part of your body, like a leg or an arm, and losing a child. You don't have to have children to know that. You don't, you, you don't even have to be a non-psychopath. And I'm sure psychopaths have stored that piece of information. They know, yeah, leg, kid, you know. This was the kid. I don't know if I did the, what do you call it, the balances correctly. Uh, okay. Um, where is that in the text? Where is that written down? It's, it can't be in the story. You don't write that down in the story. That's not in the story. Uh, is it written somewhere else? Is that, is that how you know it? When you're reading the story, you cite some other source, some other text, some other story that says, uh, this is where it's been established that uh, children are more important than, than um, appendages. Um, no, it's not there. Uh, where is it? It's, it's not in the text. That's the Hogland's point. This is not that, that sort of he called. So he he's writing an, his essay is called um, "Understanding Natural Language," which sounds I'm sorry like one of the most boring essays you could read. But the reason I read it and the reason everybody read it uh, who didn't read it is because it opens it opens and closes with a pretty good 
pretty good line. Uh, I was going to say idea, but I think he says it verbatim in the beginning and end of the same. Uh, the, the, the trouble with artificial intelligence is the computers don't give a damn. They don't give a damn. There's a, a bunch of philosophers after Hogman died wrote a whole book called Giving a Damn. Anyway, um, why don't they give a damn? How could they give a damn? They don't have, this is the way Hogman puts it, they don't have a story. They don't have, they're not part of a chronology. They don't know, what, they can't feel embarrassment. They can't, they can't understand when, when a human being in natural language writes about something like, you know, grief, grief, uh, you know, like terrible loss, ambition, you know, humiliation. How could they understand that you need a sense of, and this is where he gets into his philosopher's technical terms, which are not fun, but we have to, we have to tip our hat to these things. Not tip our hat. What are we trying? We have to acknowledge them. We have to mention them. So he, he mentions like, I think four kinds of holism that are necessary to, um, to understand natural language, for example, to understand a fable written, written in text or spoken in word. Uh, and it's like there's, there's, um, there's, I'm not putting them in order, but situational holism, you got to understand the situation, you got intentional holism, uh, you got to under, understand that, you know, they're, you, you, the, the, the events that you can observe, like in a chess match or reading about a chess match or something like that, um, do not tell you that a person wants to win a chess game or is trying to, you know, corner the, the king or something like that. That's all in your brain. It's not in the text. It's not on the chessboard. It's nowhere available. That information is not in the the um, empirical situation. So, you have to put it there. You have to, you, or you have to have it here. It all ends up being here. Situational, um, intentional, common sense. And, and the difference between intentional and common sense, he said, is that intentional is like um, you, once you understand the intentions, you don't have to keep updating it. It's like, it's it's happened prior in time. It's something you can sort of set up in your brain or in your artificial intelligence system. And then once it's set up, you can just continue to interpret the text. You can translate the text or interpret the text. Um, and, but, the, but, but common sense doesn't work that way because common sense is so vast and so difficult to store in a system and so difficult to predict when it's going to become relevant. He gives, you know, there are a lot of philosophers of language spend a lot of time coming up with these really cool phrases that phrases or sentences or, you know, pairs of sentences that are really, you know, ambiguous in a certain way and that, you know, common sense tells us what, like, you know, pants being painted on and raincoats because it's wet or something like all these things are examples that that Hoglin gives and other from others and, and I guess from his own catalog as well. Uh, the point is you need common sense to parse them to understand what they mean. Uh, and 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 the problem with common sense is that we have so much of it we take it for granted. It's it's the it's the the bedding in which we're embedded uh, in, in the world that, that when you go and try and make a machine have common sense, it's much. Now he's writing in seventy nine, but even today, com machines don't have common sense. They don't, and, and they might not for a long time. People are working on it. Um, they talk. They talk all about it in, in Architects of Intelligence, Martin Ford's you know, set of interviews. Um, you know they're working on building, but how? I mean, they don't know how to do that. Uh, not that they won't. I'm not saying they won't. I'm not saying it's possible. No one f is foolish enough to say that these days. Um, common sense holism, right? But the last holism, I think it was the last. I don't think there were five. I think there were four. The last holism is what he calls existential holism. And it's this idea that you have to be a whole person to understand simple, and it's every conversation is, is just is, is just totally pregnant with this stuff. Like you can't, it's not like some conversations are like low level and some are like high existential holism. Conference. No, it's everything. It's like, you know, you go to the store and you, you, you know, you, things happen at the store and you get embarrassed. If you get embarrassed, you know, in order to understand that story of someone getting embarrassed at the grocery store, you need to understand what embarrassment is and you need to understand what it means to care about what people think about you or care about, you know, grieving the loss of a loved one or grieving the loss of a dream, all that stuff. You need to be a whole entity, some sort of whole person thing in order to, in order to have existent, in order to satisfy the existential holism criterion of, of understanding natural languages and, and machines can't do it yet. And it, it's, it's going to be hard. Okay, fine. So, so, um, caring about things is part of being intelligent, or at least, it, I mean, you can step down the ladder, you know, do dogs care about us? Do cats? Cats definitely don't. 
I'm not a cat person. Uh, okay, what about uh, mice? What about, what do mice care about other mice? I mean, they're like, you know, in the 90% range genetic similarity, right? Um, bumblebees, grasshoppers, ants, um, bacteria, right? Bacteria, they don't care, right? Do they care? Do they care? Do bees? Do bees care about the hive? I was going to say nest. Hive, right? Do they care? That you go hit that thing with your fist because you're stupid. They're all about you now because you mess with what they care about. Yeah, it's reflexes. It's instinct. It's millions of years old. Fine. But what, what care is just an English word. Okay. So it's a word, right? It's not a technical term. We're not measuring voltages or counting anything. So let's talk about words and things. And I'm not at all alluding to the book by Ernest Gellner, which I haven't read, but I've heard about for a long time and I want to read. Um, words and things. There's big, again, we're going to get into the domain of philosophy of language here. And we're not going to get into it because if we get into it, it's a tar pit. It's, a, it's better than a tar pit. It's fun. It can be very fun. It can also be unfun. We're not going to get into it. Words and things. Is there a difference in the way that I'm using the word care right now, or the way that Hogland, or we'll get to him in a second, Harry Frankfurt, uses the word care, uh, the way they use the word care? Is there, is there a difference between those usages of the word care and the word motivation, uh, desire, want, need, will, or willpower? Or you know, Are those things different? You say yes, and then you've got to explain it on technical terms to really prove that point. Say no, and it's like, well, why do we have all those words then? They have to be different, but you can't say very easily why they're different. That's worth noticing, but that's true of a lot of things. True of, like the hardest phenomena to understand, perhaps, it definitely seems this way to me, uh, are the ones that have lots of subtle gradation between the, the different words that are in that space, you know? This is definitely, care is definitely one of those things. Okay, so Harry Frankfurt wrote, um, by the way, Hoglund's book is Having Thought, uh, Essays in the Philosophy of Mind, I think is the subtitle. Um, and uh, uh, Harry Frankfurt, a few years later, um, this is a, they're both um, compilations of essays, but uh, this is the importance of what we care about is the essay that the title essay for this book, the importance of what we care about. And he goes, he really dissects the, the philosophically dissects what, what caring is. And I'm not going to go into all the, the nuance of it. There's lots of nuance. It's very interesting, very provocative. Um, I'm not sure he's, and he doesn't think he's really conquered the, the question or, or even posed it correctly, but he's identified something that's been neglected by philosophy. He says, you know, traditionally philosophy has been systematic about epistemology, you know, what we can know or what, what to believe, and then, you know, what to do, which is, you know, ethics, loosely those two, and then care doesn't fall into either of those groups, he says. Okay, fine. There's a particular point that he makes, or, or a term that he coins, necessity. He didn't coin necessity. He, he, uh, give me a second. Let's talk about Logical necessity? No, let's not talk about it. Let's just briefly mention it. Logical necessity. Um, if this, then that. This, therefore that. That's the source. It's not like in the world. It's not physical. It just seems to be some rule of thought. Um, that's logical necessity. Uh, causal necessity. Billiard balls, you know. Angle of instance equals angle of reflection. Uh, that's causal necessity. Frankfurt thinks there's a third kind. Volitional. He calls it volitional necessity. What the heck does that mean, right? Volitional necessity. He, it's it's hard to get your head around, but and, and which I haven't yet uh, fully. I don't think um, it's this Martin Luther. He tells the story of how Martin Luther's ninety five theses. How many theses? Bang! Knife paper on the door of the church. You know, these are the ninety five theses he had. To, and and the story of. Um, Luther explaining that uh, he, you know, he he did he did it because he had to do it. He he couldn't do anything else. Now I looked into that story, and it turns out it's not really it probably didn't the way it's told is not really how it happened, or it's not really how he, Luther felt about it. But that's a digression. Um, let's say it did. When you're in those situations, or when someone's in a situation where they feel like they can't do anything else, it's not that it's not that they're so compelled by what they're going to do that they can't resist it. It's like all the other options are just. A non-starter, okay? They, they just have to do this. 
and and you can come up with lots of examples, but it, it's like these things, these situations where we can't do anything else, just not even not even an option. Frankfurt's saying that's a kind of care. There there are other kinds of care that might be you know we can choose whether or not to care about something, but this kind of care is the interesting one because well for lots of reasons. Um, now because we can we, to really do justice to the concept of care we'd have to do justice to frankfurt's essay and we're not going to do that right now because that's going to take time um but it's worth wondering whether first of all volitional volitional necessity makes any sense the idea that like he says he points out that you know it, these these instances where we do something because we feel like we can't do anything else it's it does, we don't experience those th- those moments those events as being sort of a succumbing or a loss of power so you know they can often feel empowering and and actually sort of define someone's identity and 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 make them who they are all these things so it's not as simple as sort of you know robotic behavior or or involuntary reflexes um okay so it comes back to the question um does care does care matter to natural intelligence? I think that's the question that that this that this all drives at. We have to take care seriously. We we definitely have to take whatever that word means, even if it's only something that makes sense in the context of human beings and some higher animals. We have to take it seriously. Um, but if we're going to understand natural intelligence, uh, it, it we'll have to take that seriously. But but all intelligence might be responsive or bound by this constraint of caring that 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 seems to be true if caring is a thing it it tells you about human beings it tells you what they can't do it doesn't always tell you what they will do like you can care about a child or or a dream and you know maybe you're gonna do this because of that maybe you're gonna but there are things you're not gonna do there are things you're not gonna do with your kid sell them there are things you're not going to do with your dream. Um, <laughs> I, you know, some, some equivalent, sell out, give up on it. I mean, people can give up on dreams, but, but often they can't. So, so let's, let's, let's be less strict with that. But there are, if there are bounds, constraints, boundaries on what an intelligence can do on the basis of what that intelligence cares about, natural or, or any other kind, um, that, that matters hugely. You're trying to figure out what's going on out there. Even today, you could start from some, what someone cares about, if you can get to it. You know, maybe you can't get to, maybe you can't find out. They're not telling you. There's no evidence that's unambiguous. But if you can get to it, you might know a boundary on what that person will do. What, 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 can, one, what is one constraint on their behavior? All right. Uh, no amendments, no corrections today. This is a retrace segment. 13. Our website is retrace.com, R E T R A I C E.com. Uh, references are in the show notes, and full PDF notes will be on our website. Signing off. <laughs>